Good afternoon. My name is John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services, can be found on our website at nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. The Foundation's financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Also, all of you that have, would like to see an interesting exhibit come to the Nebraska uh, Historical Society's Museum of Nebraska History at 15th of May here in Lincoln. To see the weird Nebraska exhibit on the first floor, it'll be here through 2006. And this exhibit also ties in with uh, the topic of our speaker today. Our speaker is Jim Potter, who is a research historian for the Nebraska State Historical Society. The title of his presentation today is Weird Nebraska 2, More Strange Stories and Amazing Facts. Please welcome Jim Potter. John, it's great to see so many people are interested in weird history. Obviously, my presentation is inspired by the exhibit that's outside the door. If you haven't looked at it, I hope you will take a look either today or some other time when you have a chance. Now, if Oscar were here, I hope he would be proud of me for trying my own way to bolster of useless information about Nebraska and Nebraska. If not all of the tales that I'm about to tell may be useless, certainly weird, strange, and amazing. Hence, they're also quite interesting, I think. And if they're interesting and illuminate some of the peculiar activities and personalities in Nebraska's past, then maybe they aren't really useless after all. I'll leave that for you to decide. Most of these stories I've unearthed during more than 30 years of digging in the oars of history at the State Historical Society. Several of these nuggets have been washed out by my colleagues. I'm quite surprised how many of these tales have to do with animals in some respect. I really never thought I'd find any place I could use most of them, so I'm really delighted to be able to bring them forth to the credulous public today. I've got to start with just a couple of visual really kind of our stories in their own right. Here's the first one. Now, if you had a sick doctor, uh, I would expect you to call this veterinarian because I don't think you could go wrong with a veterinarian named Dr. Cow. I photographed this uh, Long Pine Drive-In Marquee in 1994. At first, I wasn't sure whether they were advertising a porno movie or a documentary about some prominent Nebraska meat packer. Uh, then I realized that they were showing a popular Disney animated film about a young lion cub. Interestingly enough, the transportation appeared on both sides of the marquee. This headline in the Auburn Herald, July 25, 1919, caught my eye. And as the story went, tired of a life of slavery, tired of working in the sweltering heat of harvest sun, pulling huge loads that would tax the strength of an elephant all day long, his only compensation being a small to sleep at the end of a day's work and three square meals of oats, hay, and corn every 24 hours. A mule belonging to Emil Teton, in a condition of despondency Thursday, decided to end his life. He was in the barn when he made up his mind to commit the race deed. He waited until all was still, and then with a groan of despondency, he shuffled off the equine coil, hanging himself with his hopper rope. He left no note of farewell or of explanation why he was impelled to commit self-destruction. 
no female advanced him, so as to cause his heart to break. It's not only jealousy that could have entered his soul, caused him to scorn from which mules never return, and where the wicked cease from cussing and the weary are at rest, is a steel mule tractor which its master was contemplating buying. Levi Everett, who went by the name of Dynamite Pete, claimed to be the last bona fide hermit, hermit living in a cave in the United States until a few years before his death in 1949. He lived near the Platte River, about six miles west of Louisville, and was, was a well-known local personality. His nickname apparently came from his early days as a blaster in the nearby limestone quarries. Just why he became a hermit is not known, but he said he was happy living out in the woods, playing his violin, feeding the birds and animals, and paying no rent or taxes. He raised much of his own food, and his own tobacco. There are many stories of his eccentricities, but few have firm documentation. One story goes every August, and he might come to Louisville during the carnival celebration to enter the talent contest, at which he the tire was always the same, not the overalls. His hair and mustache would have been great if they'd ever been washed. As it was, they were off white with a yellow tinge. In the talent contest, he said he could not play unless he put on a shirt. While he agreed not to spit tobacco juice during his performance, shoes and a shirt were going too far and he walked off the stage. At one time in the late 1930s, Pete went to Omaha to see Bobby Jean, a performer who was being shot from a cannon in a show playing at Exarbon. I read about this cannon girl, Pete explained. Myself, there was no such thing as that. But if there is, I'm going to see it. The minor celebrity in his own right, Dynamite Pete, finagled a dinner date with Bobby Jean at the Omaha Hotel, played her some tunes on his fiddle. Two hours he left, saying, I've seen her by gum and she's great. Dynamite Pete died at Plattsmouth Nursing Home on December 26, 1949. That much seems certain. For more on Dynamite Pete, see the history section of the Nebraska website with information provided by Bill Omeyer. On October 13, 1900, Bert Martin, a ranch hand from Kiapaha County, was sent to the state penitentiary for two years for stealing a horse. A sleeping woman, baby in arms, said to be Bert's wife, stood by his side. At the end, Bert was assigned to work in the room factory for 11 months with the same cellmate. At some point, the cellmate informed prison authorities that Bert was really a woman. The team turned out to be Tina Martin. Promptly transferred to the women's section of the penitentiary. Lincoln Evening News reported she is distinctly masculine in appearance. Her former patients in Kiowa County are masking. However, Andrew was outraged when he learned of Lee Martin's anger. He declared that men or women in the penal institution her sentence to time served and received custody of her aged mother in February 1902. Although Nebraska had held a statewide scrap drive in the summer of 1942, the Federal War Production Board called for a nationwide drive to run from September 21st through October 17th. Nebraska counties and towns resumed collect scrap, particularly for rural areas. In Saunders County, the goal for the new scrap drive was 200 pounds per person. A real bonanza for the Saunders County drive was waiting in the fields and farms of the three particular Vesicle brothers, Joe, Chris, and Emmanuel, living four miles north of us. As the Wahoo paper reported, it was hard for the individual to comprehend the huge stock of scrap scattered through the groves of trees, haymakers, and buildings. In the neighborhood of 20 years, rusted for non-use, 17 
threshing machines, filled by the score, fifteen binders, and piles of plants. Of the house and nineteen cars side by side, complete with tires and motors. Fourteen of the cars are Buicks. Close by are seventeen car frames piled in a neat pile. The largest engines on the place weighed close to fourteen thousand pounds. One tractor had a good sized tree growing from between the wheels. I believe this is it. Despite pleas from Saunders County officials, the brothers resisted letting go of their scrap. According to Joe, the eldest brother, we haven't got anything we don't need. We need it all. <laughs> said this was because new machinery wasn't as good as the old stuff. The reporter noted that most of the machinery and cars looked as if they had not been used in a long time, even though Joe we can use any of them. They're all good. Finally, after hints that the federal authorities would be called in, and pressure from local officials and public opinion, the brothers agreed to sell their scrap at the prevailing prices. Between October 23rd and 26th, 20 county and state highway trucks, a hundred men, and three boom trucks loaded iron at the Pisca Chilway. The conclusion of the scrap drive, 155 tons of metal had been salvaged from the farm. More than was collected by any of the towns in Saunders County except Craig, Wahoo, and Ashland. Here's the list, and if you see there, there's their, uh, the total from their farm, 155 tons. The other towns and places are given. Lack of manpower to do more is one reason the Visca Chill contribution was relatively modest, given that some estimates that up to a thousand tons of metal scattered around their farm. Local authorities had a total of 200 pounds of scrap for each resident of Saunders County. The brothers' contribution was about 51 tons apiece. One of the oddest Nebraska weddings on record took place in the Grand Central Hotel in Seward on August 5, 1883. Lottie Grant, a 593 with the Baron and Circus, was united in matrimony to Frank Whitlock, the superintendent of the sideshow department. The groom was 130. Lottie Grant's real name was Charlotte Sykes, and Whitlock was the local report Pine was large to take care of her husband. And while the bride certainly assumed they had the responsibility, he also secured a wife who was able to protect and defend him. At one time, Lottie Grant was said to weigh 732 pounds. I found Frank Whitlock. Perhaps he is standing behind Lottie in this photograph. by no other Nebraska town, but you can notice it by driving down Main Street. Parts of the town lie in three different counties, Jackson, Dakota, and Third. According to the 1980 census, 116 Emerson residents lived in Thurston County, 1483 and 125. The Dixon Dakota County line runs down Main Street, divided into West and East. So this is Dixon County here, Dakota County here, and from this point on south is Thurston County. This tri-county status has affected Emerson and her residents in many ways. Now the newspaper was called the Tri-County Press. And other newspapers have borne the names of Tri-County this or Tri-County that. Most of the minor problems arising from the town location relate to and political issues. The town clerk has to work with three county assessors, three county clerks, and three county treasurers. Some residents own property in all three counties and visit the county on official business. Some members of the vote in Dixon some in Dakota County, and some in Thurston County. It's in the county where the license was issued, it is said that the had a few blocks to another part of town in order for the ceremony to be legal. 
since the license has been issued in the county where they actually lived. The town marshal, however, has jurisdiction anywhere in town. Thus, the story about bootleggers living in a house that straddles the county line and moving the booze to the next room in the adjacent county to avoid arrest are probably folklore. <laughs> According to the 1980 U.S. Census, seven incorporated towns with fewer than 1,000 residents were located in three counties. This would be across the country. Allentown, Georgia, population 321, was located in four counties. W. W. Abbott of Lincoln was a man possessed of at least modest musical talent. The Medley, a periodical devoted to the music of art in the capital city, said he had won quite a distinction from several of his compositions. Some was entitled Spaniard, Frolic. I'd like to pay a play for you now, recorded by my colleague, Andy Drake. The subtitle of the song makes more sense is connected to the drawing on the back of the sheet music. The song was written in 1898 when the United States had declared war on Spain and clearly won a political as well as a musical statement. Now, sending fans to you, I know you haven't practiced the song very much, but if plotting tempo is true to form, having bullets fired at your feet might be the only way you could dance to this song. In the 1880s, the first dentist in Pierce, Nebraska was also the town blacksmith. William Lubke was a German immigrant who patterned his dental instruments after those used by his mentor in Germany, a blacksmith who also extracted teeth. As the Norfolk Daily News put it, whenever a patient came to town complaining about a toothache, Mr. Lubke would have them sit down anywhere. Many a time they sat on an old wood pile behind the shop and presto changeo, the tooth would be out. Charles Pollard, another local blacksmith, apprenticed with Mr. Lubke and recalled how Mr. Lubke would pull teeth and make no charge for his services. Having a blacksmith as one's dentist might have its advantages. If a tooth proved particularly stubborn, the dentist blacksmith could employ, employ a cold chisel and a small sledgehammer. If anesthesia were needed, a tap on the head with the sledgehammer would probably do it. <laughs> To explore how animals connect onto music, the Lincoln Star sent a report to a young violinist Laverne Wood to the Animal Park all day in 1920. Wood played the violin for bears, a bison, elk, an eagle, and some alligators. When she attempted to imitate animal sounds, none of the critters paid any attention. At the bear cage, she launched into humorette and the Bruins stood up and seemed to follow the tune with rapt attention. When you and I were young, Maggie, caused four young coyotes to, coyotes to wail and whine mournfully. In such a racket that park visitors came to see what was going on. The bison, basking in the sunshine, paid no attention when Miss Wood tried to jazz to it. You've got to see it every night. The elk also bored. A series of screeches and sent Mr. Bison running to the far reaches of his pants. The eagle was completely indifferent to music, not even responding to a condition of the star spangled band. The the pictures completely the music left to do, whether we were convinced that all of the theories about music and animals were right or not. A bystander commented, the Rock Island train can get more out of than all the violins in the world. Of course, in those days, the track ran right by the zoo. The report would have been in a similar experiment to the Sandhills Ranch near Eli, Nebraska, in 1910. He was a noted local fiddler with the reputation of being able to make a violin talk. After reading newspaper stories,
stories about how birds and animals had been attracted and charmed by music. Peterson tried on the best of coyotes. One afternoon, a few days later, Peterson and his son Henry went to a barn on a ranch. And Peterson wasn't up his bow. He started with Devil's Dream, Fisher's Hornpipe, and when the flowers bloomed again, but not a coyote appeared. He then tried some of his best ragtime, and soon coyotes popped up on the hills around the barn, howling in unison. There he sat, however. Then the fiddler tried a more plaintive offering, home sweet home, and the circle of coyotes rose to their feet and slowly walked toward the barn. When Peterson stopped playing, the coyotes sat down. He saw that we will meet to him. There will be one vacant chair. The coyotes came toward the barn on a trot. As soon as they got within range, Henry opened fire with his 22 rifle, killing or wounding the coyote with nearly every shot. The boy went from window to window, firing until he ran out of ammunition. At that, the father laid down his bow, and the unwounded coyotes turned tail and fled back over the hills. The coyotes lay dead around the barn. Now, I know a chat in the play is fiddle, and I was thinking one day we ought to go out and try. Uh, we will meet to miss him there. Vacant chair and just see what happens. In early July 1901, South Omaha businessmen sponsored the first street fair held in that city. A highlight was to be a series of bullfights featuring real Mexican matadors and Mexican fighting bulls. A 5,000 seat arena was constructed with a bull ring and different oak boards. And lawsuits threatened by the main society, the promoters agreed that no bulls aren't killed. Nevertheless, the members would enter the ring with the bulls to demonstrate their skills. One or two bulls were trampled in the process, some of the better bull in The first bull fight was on July 4th, but only one bull showed much panache. South Omaha newspaper, not wanting to put too much of a damper on the forthcoming bull fights, noted only as a rule, bulls were not as aggressive as the crowd again. A 1929 World Herald story about the bullfights claimed that someone turned an old cow into as this drawing show, which was more vicious than bulls. No mention of the incident in February 1929. During the performance of the 8th, bull actually ribs. This turned out to be a high point of the exhibition. Nebraska Governor Ezra Savage and his staff of 12 resplendently uniformed generals and colonels attended the bullfight. It was a very hot day. He described bulls as being a condition of innocuous desuetude. Instead of being, the bulls merely went occasionally off and brushed the light on their necks. Only the Jews and spectators kept them from dozing off into a jolly siesta. The paper further noted that perhaps the intensity caused the bull's lassitude, or possibly they were awed by the presence of the savage. Our new British Herald in the July Bull reported that the bulls were thorough gentlemen. The bull fighters also were gentlemen. It was most interesting to note the general case with which they avoided outraging or even the feelings of the bull and how delicate the latter reciprocated kind being willing to take offense, even had offense been offered. The next day, Governor Savage sent a letter to the Omaha papers that critics of the bullfight were inhumane. Steers at the stockyards, he said, are subjected to more cruelty. They also have more spunk. I would have no hesitation going, to, going into the animal's bull with a child. They'd make friends with people who would keep the flies off of them. Fair came to a close. It was revealed that bulls were not fighting bulls, but merely Nebraska durbs. Some farmers bought the lot of them, yoked them up to wagons, and departed for Wahoo. The bullfights had been a financial disaster to the fair promoter. The Omaha paper lamented that the first attempt of the Magic City at show business has left the coterie of her more, most forceful businessmen in sackcloth and ashes. Presumably, the bulls settled down on Sunday Day Farms to ruminate quietly on their brief moment of fame in the city. The 
Here's the point of the investors and operators were deploying science to increase yields and yields. such as the Nebraska program and experiment stations operated by the university and even special education programs to serve that their entire special hosted by the Burlington Railroad had influence. With the creation of the agricultural extension program in 1915, the county agency to helping farmers keep abreast of the latest techniques and technology. Organizations ranging from 4 H clubs to quite often livestock associations were thriving. One local group was the Clay County Club, which was devoted to better soil raising methods. The club had its own members. I'd like to say that was recorded by my friend up in Shad. Roots in Nemaha County. Some of you have visited Coriel Park near Brock, which the family created and opened to the public. Five in Coriel Senior and his son, Leland Jr., became successful in the real estate business. But that's why they qualify for the list of stories and amazing facts. As the story goes, when Junior was an infant, Levi Sr. built a playpen in his office and started taking Junior to work with him. When Junior began school, Dr. Corey Elledge is office near school. Junior dropped in his school and said, he and his father were together. When Junior graduated, he was a full business partner. Either he or his father made business decisions and from the account without approval from each other. This close relationship soon extended to the way the father and son dressed. One day, Junior went to get a new suit and took his father along. Junior picked out a suit, and Senior said he'd take one just like it. The next time Junior wanted to tie, he bought two alike and gave one to his father. Gradually, their entire rooms became duplicates. Whichever one got up first in the morning would call the other and say, I'm wearing 33 suits, the second tie, 37 shoes. The numbers were arranged for convenience so you wouldn't have to describe anything. In the 1940s and 40s, father and son and their families lived from one another, senior at 2850 Sheridan Boulevard, junior at 2901 Stratford Avenue. One servant served both houses. One week, only signed at seniors, and the next week at juniors. I can't be sure that that is true, but I do have evidence for some orientation. Here is a photo of a court office giving to father and son in the uniform of the In 1899, the Omaha World Herald floated the idea that to honor Cornbread, which it called the Yellow King in form. After all, Cornbread had been a staple for many early five years, waited for breakfast dinners, and in many instances, it fully saved starvation. The idea fell flat after eight Fried and frickin' he had eaten it. A couple years afterward, 
Yes, it is. Blue bore balls of anterior easterlings in touch with the edges of the rasping corn dodger. But old fellows in there, thank you. All views resonated with the carton of the engine. Holmes kicks on having to put any more baked, boiled, fried, seed cracked corn into the interior of his cork reel system. And we see where the kernel is right. We remember the days of our time we had fried money for breakfast, boiled fish for dinner, milk and milk for supper, and for dessert it was milk, demilch, mush on the milk, and on rare occasions corn pone on the side. It was tough on the intestinal part of our anatomy, and we think it would be detrimental to the best interests of the breakfast to have a cornbread day. Perhaps the few citizens of our fair state to work the fertilizer. The Omaha Auditorium on September 7th, 1926, and left the airwaves to end up the 30 minutes Western News that had been tuned in. Fred Paisel, his call is described as a smooth, musically insistent command. He pitched the video, pitched the judge, no pig could resist. Fred is Technique as giving the first call as an introduction, the second as an invitation, the third as an order, and the last several as a pint of planks and a lazy animal that may be immersed in the mud somewhere out in the hills. The competition, sponsored by the World Herald and the Omaha Radio Trades Association, drew 6,000 spectators and a radio audience of unknown proportions. Batesel, a farm worker and ditch digger from Madison, Nebraska, received the World Herald's gold medal on a check for $700. He had bested 49 callers, including six women, from Illinois, Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, Alabama, Arkansas, Wyoming, and oddly enough, the District of Columbia. <laughs> I can get the key fix now, said Fred, and I'm going to two shows to be a milk cow. I got past second grade in school, and I reckon I better fix things so and children will have a good living. If you got one of these telephones around here, he said, I leave all telephone apps in my hometown. I told my wife when I left home that I would. She was just a little doubtful. Fred would not be confined to the corn world. The New York newspaper announced his triumph, and the October 9, 26 issue of the Literary Digest told his story and published this musical. short story by the English writer P.G. Woodhouse. The story, as you can see, entitled Pig Hooey, tells of the prize-winning Berkshire Sow, the Empress of Blandings, who won off her feet and got thrown in jail following the local pub. The pig's owner, the Earl of Hemsworth, all that news to her to her form of rotundity. In a tale, pending Shropshire agricultural. James Elford, a young man working on farm, did the solution. I imagine she was a pig man because he is. She probably knows his call. Tell Lord Elford that pigs are criminal, and all calling is worse than you learn. I've studied under Fred Pates of Lincoln, the master. I've known for the leap from the when a man called the big man. That then demonstrated Fred Pates of There's a lot more to this story than that. Of course, in the end, Lord Edward, the help of Alfred and Butler, enticed the Empress of Blandings out of her stock back to her trough. Following the restoration of her ugly appetite, she went on to take the silver medal at the Shropshire Ag Show. Fred returned to Madison after his great triumph and returned work, resumed work as the town handyman. 
No sewer ever ran backwards. He dug a ditch, recalled an acquaintance. And of the graves he dug in the cemetery, families were consoled with the thought that their dear ones lay straight, level, and true, perfectly sculpted graves. Fred Pates lived in Madison for the rest of his days. The Hall was still in February 1933 when Master Carl Stephan invited Fred to the atmosphere to the New Market Report on the radio station WKA. Fred flew as a he overloaded the broadcasting lines and blew out more than $200 worth of tube. Putting the stage off the air three near and not the broadcasting apparatus to handle the vocal chart. As far as I know, no monument to free papers in Madison. When a new process is in plan in 1967, the idea of the pixels was in the past paper made no mention he had the work creating business for most with that I'm going to let Oscar who had the first word have the last word thank you at this point I can answer anybody would take questions